Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary from Santa Barbara's top journalists and political leaders about the most important news events in our community. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. This week, it's all politics all the time as we perform a post-mortem on the November 6th election with a look at all the key races and issues from Santa Barbara, Goleta, and the county to campaigns that made news around the state and across the country. Joining me tonight, Josh Molina, who covers politics for Newshawk. School board member, Laura Capps. Nick Welsh, executive editor of The Independent. And former city council member, Dale Francisco. Thank you all for coming. All right, so let's start. What surprised you the most? What was the thing that, the biggest surprise on election night, Josh? I think uh, there are two surprises. Just one. You only get one. Because you're going to... Marsha, Marsha Croninger beating Darcel Elliott yeah. by such a significant margin was a big upset. I mean, Darcel raised a lot more money, spent a lot of more money. Marsha was really playing defense the whole time during the election, and Darcel's a professional campaigner, and she's had years of running successful campaigns for Doss Williams and others. The fact that she lost so big was... It was surprising. I think you predicted Darcel. No, I, I think it was actually Nick, but what, what, surprised <laughs> you, what surprised you the most? Locally, that surprised me the most, for sure. Uh, nationally, I was hoping for Stacey Abrams. That still, she could still pull governor it out. Governor of, uh, the yeah. almost governor of, of Georgia. Georgia. Yeah, given the year of the woman and all that, but yeah. The year of the woman, yeah. How about you? You know, given the fact that we had such non-nail-biting uh, races of turnouts that we had we had a record turnout for uh, 71% 71% for off year elections. And so what, people were all fired up. They wanted to go. There was no real races that people could sink their teeth in. The, the premier race was uh, for the congressional uh, district. And, and Salou Carbajal, the incumbent, pretty much won that about 12 months ago. Um, it was never really a contest. We had a school board race and we had a city college race. So but turnout. It was really, I think, a lot of people just showing up because they were so upset at what's going on nationally, they had to express it locally. What surprised you, Dale? I think that's right. I think of all the things, obviously I agree with Marsha Croninger, that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, what I think was most surprising to me was what happened in Montecito Water District where you had two incumbents, two competent Incumbents who Judy Ishkanian. Julie Judy Ishkanian in the sanitary district and Dick Shakowitz on the water board. They've both done a good job. It's hard to really object to anything they had done, and yet this new slate came in and just swept everything away. And that's fine. I mean, I, sometimes I think the voters just get tired of the old people and they want new people. Um, I think the people who are coming into the water board are going to find out that there's a bit of a learning curve there. Yeah. Well. Uh, as far as I was concerned, the biggest uh, surprise was the school board race hmm. because I did not expect that one two duo to win um, Cape, Cape Ford. I was kind of hoping that Cape Ford would slide in a second because I thought she was the most qualified candidate. But I assumed uh, Ismael would win, Ish would win, and then when Rose finished second, I, I was really surprised. So how did that happen, Josh? Well, you know, Kate clearly distanced herself as the most knowledgeable candidate. I mean, I'm not saying she's going to be the she's going to end the achievement gap in two years, but of all of the uh, candidates running, she was clear, specific, articulate, good communication but, skills. But and how, how do you so, that? Nobody. I mean, how did that get out? I mean, well, I think from our coverage, she's got she? years of experience in the district relationships, and you only have to spend about five minutes with her, and you can sort of get that impression. Um, how did Rose win, and Ish didn't? Ish didn't really run a really great campaign. He and wasn't out there. Rose has, uh, you know, she grew up here. She's raised children here. You cannot overstate the importance of relationships mm -hmm. and. Uh, and she had a campaign manager, and she had like a professional campaign manager, Mary Rose, yeah. and, and Kathy Maria, the mayor of the city of Santa Barbara, you know, moved water for her. And so Kathy and Mary really gave her an advantage that Ish, who was very soft-spoken and not a, a chest thumper, um, really lacked. I think, I mean, I think that Ish ran a good campaign. I think that 
sure, it's surprising, but I, we all were saying of the of the four, we didn't quite know who would win, right? So I mean, I would I would think it's it's a woman thing. I mean, we see this. You're the woman. You're the woman. We see this across the country. Why not? When people are trusting local government to do what they should, and they see women on the ballot, and they next to their name is social worker, and next to their name is former superintendent with Kate Ford. You know, I think that that's powerful. And there was a substantial, you know, significant gender gap in the electorate in 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 the at least in the ballots that had been sent in by election day. Sure, sure. It was plus plus six or plus seven hmm. women or something like that. Um, any surprises in the school board that that you saw, or did you? That's how you would have called it had you been here. If if <laughs> if I had called it in advance, I would have said it probably would have been the Indy endorsement team. Uh, so I was a little bit surprised that Mark Alvarado came in number four. Um, three. I think three. he came in third. Oh, was it three? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Close. yeah. So their campaign consultant said that he won because he, he brought Kate in first and then Mark beat the dish. So <laughs> that's, that's the way that goes. What difference is, will this new membership on the board make as a practical matter? I'm looking forward to serving with them both. I, you know, I, I, I'm relieved that Kate Ford will join us because of her experience, um, she, especially because Kate Parker is stepping off the board after a tremendous service to this community of 12 years. That's happening. Her last meeting is She was next elected to city council. I'm yeah, a, yes. a city college Yes, board. exactly. So I think that given her just her expertise and knowledge of how the district works, to have Kate Ford come in is a pretty great trade. Uh, that's how I view it. And I'm looking forward. Rose is, uh, by all accounts, just a wonderful person and this social work background. And she's she's actually spent time in each of the district, each of the schools in the district, like substantive time as a social worker. So I'm looking forward to her perspective from that. All right. So on the uh, city college uh, front. Um, Nick here particularly was distracted by all the money that Darcel was raising. And, <laughs> you know, I predicted that, that Marsha would win on the newsmakers election day lunch yep. pool. I was only, the only reason, because it was peer group pressure <laughs> by you and Josh. Anyway, um, were, we, were we foolish to think that organization and, and money uh, alone would be enough to win that? Or did you feel like Marsha's... Uh, Keep the community and community college. I thought that was, was a smart difference. message, and I thought pinning the message on Darcel that she wanted to build housing for seven thousand international students, whether that's true or not, that was excellent messaging. It was really Jerry. You were the one who I don't know where that number came from. I think you just sort of she told me. So. She told air. me. No, no, no. That, that's how many more uh, students are from out of the area, and she said yes that the college had a. Uh, had a duty and a responsibility to build because housing she to accommodate. Because it's taking from low income. What's that? Because the well, housing, that was the argument. That's the yeah. argument. I don't know if that's that's. An yeah, I think that's the true. thing that people forget. I mean, it really was a classic tortoise and the hare campaign, and Darcel definitely looks like the hare. She had the, the organizing chops. She, you know, where and, and Marsha, you know, it takes her forty-five minutes sometimes to get to the point. But the deal is, Marsha. I know people. Like <laughs> Marsha spent a year preparing, going to uh, city college meetings, watching them before she ever jumped in. So she is like this ridiculously thorough, prepared person. And although she didn't run a flashy campaign or one that we saw, but she was sending out emails. And if you looked at them, they were these photographs of housing complexes that were like six and seven stories high that were sort of engulfed and canonize any, anything. Um, so it, she was taking the housing message and, and taking it to a, a, a logical extreme or an illogical extreme and hanging that on Darcy, uh, Darcel. And Darcel never really talked enough about education. She talked more about housing. And mm -hmm. so the core mission somehow got lost in the shuffle. Plus, I think. Something has to be said for knowing the district and living in the district where you're running. And um, well, she lived there. I mean, Darcel lived there, but she didn't. She, she mean, lived there. Her uh, um, no, Marsha's husband is what head of the Riviera Association. That kind of gives you a huge layout. Yeah. Which is a very yeah. I mean, it's organized. Here's I mean, the thing: Darcel ran a city council campaign in a board of trustees race yeah. because that's what she's so used to. Darcel never talked about education policy. It was about mm. inclusion. It was about housing. It was never about actually what's happening on campus and the challenges. And Marsha just had that experience. 
That being said, all that money, right, gave her a significant advantage to unseat her, but Nick's point is exactly right. Narcel would have a better chance winning a seat on the Santa Barbara City Council than she would in this district. she have any money left? Maybe she will. Because this district, well, she's in Kristen Senna's district, so that's no. not going to happen. But um, this district, is, is, is they're educated voters on the issues that affect Santa Barbara City College. And if you're running for an education seat, I mean, you have to talk about education. And Marsha made that comment. But I was just surprised because there was so much money that you would think that it would be a little bit closer. But... Now it's, it's like uh, 64 and yeah. endorsements. Endorsements. Yeah. Endorsements. Yeah. 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 All she had was a Kristen? endorsement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kristen and Hannah Beth. And it was a big night for Kristen mm -hmm. because of what Josh likes to call the Kristen Snedden factor. I'll call it that too. What, what, what is the Kristen Snedden factor? <laughs> Well, what is it? I mean, she was behind this this election, as you pointed out too. She was behind Marsha, and she was behind um, Kate strongly, hmm. and she actually right. recruited Kate to run. So there you go. But like her, and, Kate and Marsha are kind of very high quality women candidates who the never got a without chance the endorsement of the Democratic, of the Democratic Party and our Democrats. Do we? Do you think that we overestimate the importance of the Democratic Party, Josh? Well, particularly, we've, we've certainly we've <laughs> certainly seen a lot of Democratic Party endorsed candidates not make it. And it is a mystery to me what their selection process is. I mean, if they had both Kristen Snedden, and no offense to Jim Scafidi, but Jim Scafidi, who as a candidate was, was rather colorless, if they had those two sitting there together, how would they possibly pick Jim? They didn't. They didn't. It's well, because, we, we don't need to go of, back to this. But yeah. She jumped in way late, and she admits she was. I mean, she didn't get in until very I'll, late. I, I think the Democratic Party is still hugely influential because you have this network and this infrastructure of people campaigning for you. The problem with Darcel was it was in this limited district. If it were this bigger district, I think Darcel wins. Um, Duraka Laramore Hall, your buddy. Um, I don't know. I don't know his exact yeah, full role. Full and frank exchange of views. Right. <laughs> um, Facebook's a great place for if, that. If he's taking <laughs> less, <laughs> <nobody hears him. laughs> if he's taking less of a role in being sort of the mastermind of the politics, which he says he is, I think we are going to see fewer Democrats getting elected because, for whatever you think of Duraka, he's extraordinarily effective as a mastermind and. If he's not as involved, we're going to see more candidates who are going to uh, get elected that are not endorsed by the party. Gail, uh, just email me and I'll send you Josh's personal. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. I want that on my trip. So highly effective as a mastermind. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, so salute to the shock of everyone was reelected, but he 12 points. That was pretty good. That is pretty um, good. That, that, that surprised me. That was a surprise. And We'd set that over under at nine. What did you? Yeah, I think I had it at I can't remember, nine. Yeah. yeah was but I'm, I mean, the bigger surprise for him, I think, is great that he gets to go back and be in the majority, which is just a game changer for, for a job. I mean, he actually can push legislation and get it passed. And All the way over to the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> Where was <laughs> that? <laughs> but no. Some things. I mean, I, I think that. Um, I think that uh, Justin Fareed uh, was a victim of Republican triage. Um, they, the Republican Party had to throw uh, the, the widows and orphans overboard because they, they, there was a route on, um, and so that they had to defend defendable seats. And they looked at Santa Barbara and they said, why are we going to put money here? We don't have that kind of money when everybody else was getting. But 40 Republicans quit in the past year. Um, or announced their retirement because they couldn't get along with Trump. Um, so that opened up this huge opportunity for the Democrats. And in that context, the Republicans didn't have the resources to put any chits down on poor Justin, now making a third and perhaps final uh, What do you bid. think? I mean, your, your point is that it's just it's very tough. really hard to be. It doesn't matter what it is. I mean, the very, the, in, in, a, in a wave election year like 2010, for instance, the chances of a congressman getting reelected are 85%, an incumbent, 85% chance of being reelected. Regardless of and in many right? Yes, and in, and in many congressional elections, it's 98%. Hmm. So what, what Justin was doing 
was taking on an almost impossible task, no matter what the circumstances right. had been. Now, and salute, you know, unless he does something really like egregious. Exactly, exactly. There has to be, in order for an incumbent to lose, there has to be some kind of disqualifying scandal or just gross in Like right. Duncan Hunter, for well, example. <laughs> you're saying, was, we're saying to be on, on the way. I mean, we, we saw, was, I think we're at 32 Dems flipped seats this, this cycle. But they weren't all necessarily incumbents, right? Some of them were open seats or not? Some were open, open. Some were open. But, but Dana Rohrbacher. Right. And 18 yeah. of those are women. But, you know, after all of the, the, the buildup um, by journalists, I name no names, about how important these six or seven seats in California were, it mm -hmm. turned out not to be very important at all because it was all done before. Well, we got to 23 prior to getting to yeah. California. So we're, we're in a comfortable, Democrats are in a comfortable place. And it, and it, it, but it looks like Democrats will only win about three, right? We're at two right now with Katie Hill and Harley Ruda. Um, who beat Rohrbacher. Who beat Rohrbacher. And but we're potential. Katie Hill beat Steve Knight. Katie Hill, yeah, Steve Knight just conceded uh, yesterday afternoon, which is great. And I have to say, back to your point of everybody being so revved up, everybody I know from Santa Barbara campaigned actively for Katie Hill. Yeah, right. I mean, it was the closest district and so activated. And, you know, Starshine was there, you know, Planned Parenthood was sending buses down. I mean, I wonder, you know, what the Santa Barbara effect was. For I her. think, you know, the Santa Barbara because, effect was, yeah. I mean, like on Sunday afternoon, you would see like large groups of women at various places. They all had their Katie Hill stuff yeah. on. They were all phone banking like crazy. You had yeah. people going to uh, Las Vegas or uh, for Jackie Rosen. For Jackie Rosen, who also won yep. against um, what's his name, yeah. Heller. Yeah. And um, Katie Hill, when she was here in Santa Barbara, when you interviewed her, um, I was with her uh, Monday night before the election, and her camp, her finance person told me that the fundraiser she did here was their best fundraiser of the cycle. Which is hmm. significant. She is raised that eight, right? Yeah, she raised eight million dollars. So you know, at Susan Rose's house? No, they raised about <laughs> ninety thousand dollars at Susan Rose's house from Santa Barbara's, and then but eight million total, which is just, I mean, crazy. Wow. Do you Congressional. think that the um, the work of women from Santa Barbara was more or less important than the five million dollars that Michael Bloomberg put in? <laughs> <laughs> they went, you know, on the ground, kind boots of on the ground, <laughs> boots on the ground. You said something interesting because the, the other Katie was Katie Porter, who was running down in Orange County. Orange County, um, yeah, against. against um, Mimi, 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 Mimi Walters. Walters. But yeah. you said something interesting about the difference between those two campaigns, that those two Democratic Katie's, yeah. that they did different. So I've been spending time with their campaigns because of uh, this poverty pack that I work on. But I was one interesting part is that Katie Porter, who is poised to lose, although it's not definitive, there's still there's still a lot of votes out there. Um, she actually ran a lot of ads with Trump, whereas Katie Hill. Didn't never and that seems Trump. never mentioned Trump and that and in, in your interview you, I tried you to experienced draw out, that yeah. yeah and that seems to have been a winning strategy hmm. because because at this slice of the pie with with such, such a divisive nature of this midterms people sort of know where they are on Trump um, and you're only really speaking to such a small margin of undecideds that, uh, you know because everyone's so activated that they those those undecideds on um, the congressional they really want to hear the issues and how you're going to actually improve their lives and they don't really want to hear about Trump so Katie Hill's campaign made the strategic decision to just focus on her focus on health care focus on you know the bread and butter issues of that you know health you know got her to Congress yeah um, in the city, voters approved measures B and C. Uh, measure B will give us even year elections rather than, and, and Dale, you think this is a much needed reform. Right? <laughs> yes, you see, exactly right. <laughs> and now that's the final nail in the coffin of the Republican Party in Santa Barbara. Um, the <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> it really is. Uh, well, I mean. Actually, with districts, it may not be. No, I think with districts, it, it's additive, unfortunately. The, um, the problem with even your elections for the city, I think, is, and this is the argument that I made years ago when we had an election on this last time, is it will inevitably de-emphasize city issues. That's, it's, that's just the truth. The city will be the tail end of a very long ballot. And it's true that fewer people vote in those odd year elections, but the people who vote are totally focused on the city issues, which I think is better. But uh, the people have decided differently. Yeah. 
So there was, was there a previous election on this? Mm -hmm. it, it failed. No, it was it failed. That was, it was I don't remember the year, but it so did it fail. So it went from failing to seventy-two percent or something. Yeah, yeah. In three years, how well, did that happen? Because it's, it's an even year this year, and oh. it's just, well, the other thing that's was, not the only reason that it, that police and fire a campaign. Put, yeah. put a lot of money to oppose it last time. There right. was a active, organized, influential campaign against it uh, before. There was no campaign at all, one way or the other, this time, except the Dems put it on the uh, door knockers. So the thing is that uh, the Democratic Party, going back in the even year, there's a ticket, so they're going to be out advocating for their yeah. point. Voter, more voter turnout means Democrats are going to win. Lower, lower voter turnout means Republicans have a better chance. So Dale's right. It's going to take a crossover Republican candidate to, to win a seat, I think, in and, some and of these And you districts. think that this... this uh, increase is a, a, a bad trend for Republicans that's already been made uh, worse by district elections? There's, well, what, no, there's right. no chance? I mean, the district elections pretty much guaranteed two seats to Democrats, period. It, it, that's, it's, it's a form of gerrymandering. Um, we always know that Districts 1 and Districts 3 are going to elect Democrats. Whether they get the endorsement or not, I mean, Jason ran without the endorsement of the party and won. Um, this, again, you're, you have a much higher Democratic turnout in even your elections. That's just reality. Yeah. All right. And then we had uh, Measure C. Josh, we'll, we'll have a special uh, online version where you can explain <laughs> the, uh, the rules of Measure C of how we fill a, a vacancy in the districts. Um, <laughs> measures G and H, though, were interesting because... Uh, they were both about reapportionment. They both talked about creating an independent commission to, to redraw the maps for the, the supervisor seats. G1, H did not. Why? The Democratic Party put all its marbles behind uh, Measure G, which had more members on the committee. It was more diversity, et cetera, et cetera. Well, 11 members uh, versus As opposed five. five. Right. And, and so the Democrats... And particularly out in Isla Vista, apparently, I'm, I'm hearing anecdotally that um, students and, and people who are concerned about uh, Isla Vista and where it fits into the political jigsaw puzzle uh, took uh, the, the Republican uh, oil company back version um, personally. What's wrong with oil? Huh? <laughs> yeah. They, they, they took it personally and reacted accordingly. So the Measure G advertising from San Luis Obispo had nothing to do with it. Had nothing to do I don't with think it. there was any sort of spillover radiation. But the, the, the Republican, or the specter of the Republican threat was that they were going to split, somehow split Isla Vista in half, and they would, they would lose their you vote know, and be the disenfranchised. Long, the long-term trend in the, in the county, at least right now, and who knows, it could change, but the long-term trend is larger population in the North County and a static, more or less, population on the South Coast. Long term, eventually, that's going to create incredible pressure to keep Isla Vista in the second district. And that's what the Democratic Party, obviously, is desperate to avoid at any cost. Uh, but what I will say about G&H, G is an improvement over the current system. Yeah, because they're not, they, you don't have the supervisors yeah. drawing their own district. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that's the system the state w w went mm -hmm. through a couple of years ago. It's yeah. worked, worked very well. Yeah. So, good Can I have Dale a question here? We talk about Democratic Party, Democratic Party. There obviously are conservative young people at UCSB. There are conservative young people at City College. How they get in? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they're, I mean, the filters aren't good enough yet, obviously. What stops the Republican Party from being more organized and, and having more of an infrastructure? Why can't you have... Yeah, Dale, what stops it? <laughs> Especially, like, say, right now. If the Democrats are out at 5 a.m. knocking on doors every election day, why can't the Republicans get their stuff together and say, hey, we're going to have a presence as well? It, it, a lot of it depends on the internal party organization. And what you have, I think, in the Republican Party without going out of my way to insult people, you have a lot oh, of... go ahead. You have, a, <laughs> you have a lot of old timers yeah. on the Republican Party Central Committee and that, that population has not changed in a long time. Uh, I think there needs to be some new people and some new ideas in the Republican organization. But then the other, I mean, the obvious big problem you have 
is there is, I believe, a Republican exodus from the state. People have figured out this is not going to change. If I want to be a conservative and I want to be effective, I need to live somewhere else. Well, for the first time ever, we now have in Santa Barbara County more to, uh, no party preference than we have right. Republicans. And more and statewide yeah. as well. And the last time we had Republicans doing, you know, respectably out of the Vista was when Brooks Firestone right. uh, was county supervisor, and he was very smart because he brought wine and beer. <laughs> and bought Good old-fashioned American and, and, politics. But he was a moderate. I mean, he, 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 was, he was a moderate. Yeah. I mean, I, elephant in the room, I don't think with a president like Donald Trump, it's the time that you see students been. are going to be like, I'm a Republican, let me mm. form a committee. You know, I mean, no. I think, yeah. We have he to chases take, everybody. Yeah. It takes but they weren't organized before Trump. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, now's <laughs> not the time to start the revolution. <laughs> I mean, look, look at poor Justin. I mean, Justin Fleury, I mean, he... Is that his... Is that like his official ballot? Poor, <laughs> Poor Justin. Poor Justin. I mean, he, has to, Ted he, has, to, he has to run sort of under the Trump, you know, mojo, but without embracing Trump and right. without being dragged down. And he was in a, if, even if he was a much more skillful um, operator, he would have had a hard time with that choice. You know, I'll tell you, in 2016, I was chairman of the Republican Party, and one of the things that we had to do was disassociate our candidates from Trump as much as possible. And that's not because I have anything against President Trump, but it's looking at the reality of this area. Of this right. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, I think Trump was why we had 71% in Santa Barbara County. Sure. I mean, that is really, I mean, given the, the, the lack of races, that was really an impressive All memory. I know is Austin Stukins. Yes unfriended me on Twitter this morning, so I guess I, I just feel used. <laughs> Election's over, he has no need for He's on his way back to, uh, <laughs> back to New Orleans, probably. No, I think he was going to get a place here in Carp or something like that. I blocked him, so I'm good. Right. <laughs> Austin, I'll give you Josh. <laughs> All right, Josh, your uh, coverage of the Goletus, uh, Goleta mayor's race was, was second to none. In fact, it was exactly second. It is, to it is, <laughs> it is, it is the good land. Yamamura wrote about that race. That's, you know, but, but, but in reading your stories, I have to say I was I mildly surprised on election night that, that Paula, Paula won so easily. You know why? Mom. Democratic She's Party. Democratic Party. And, and <laughs> You're the woman. You're and, woman. And, and, well, also, let's just put it, I mean, the leader has experienced a, this great sort of instant pop up in the last couple of years of all this development that had been simmering for however long, and there was sort of a big reaction against it. And Bennett was sort of, uh, he, although he's a Democrat, he was very much Michael, friendly Michael. to that, Michael Bennett. That's for you, Sheila Young. Yeah. She, Sheila Lodge. Um, this is one where the Democrats, where Paula got the message right, unlike Darcel. But Bennett is responsible for all the traffic and congestion and housing in Goleta, and if you elect him, we're just going to see more and more and more. She's partially that right. like Marsha's house sign, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that, that was super effective. Uh, Bennett was on the council when a lot of these things were approved a long time ago. Um, it's certainly not all his fault. But uh, Perotti just connects with, she's, you she's, know, She a, does connect with She's people. friendly, she's yes. nice. When you talk to her, you don't feel like you're like, oh my goodness, I need to talk to this elected official. She's really nice. She's really down to earth. She talks to you like she's just a friend of yours. Yeah. And, uh, and she means business. And the Democratic Party. Why didn't you say these things for, before she was elected? I'm just curious. You know. I did. I did say she would win, unlike you. No, no, you did. I'm you happy did. we're talking about Galita because do you know that this show has a bad reputation of ignoring Galita? I know. So we I should know. have started with Paula Perotti. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's never too late. Thanks for oh, wait, that, it is Josh. Too late. <laughs> Thanks for our Galita. Okay, so on state right. props, uh, Prop 6, which was the... Uh, Repeal the gas tax. Cynical. The, cynical. 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 Approach. <laughs> cynical well, were you approach. surprised? This was to repeal the 15 cent or 12 right. cent gas tax that the governor... It was, was written in such a way it was guaranteed to fail. Um, Why? I, I thought... I, I mean, wasn't it supposed to be like a get out the vote? For I think if it had been, if it appeared on the ballot in language that actually advertised what it was doing, yes. But when you put a ballot proposition that says, let's decrease funds for roads and highways, it's probably going to lose. So you think it was, uh, it was, you that think it was cynical it. On, on behalf of the Attorney General? Yeah, yes I do. But you think it was cynical that it was there at all? 
I do. I think it was about Republican turnout. Yeah, and then when they needed to go elsewhere, as you point out, they pulled all, I mean, there was no more money to go in there, right? Mm -hmm. I guess, I don't know. Well, it's interesting because California is no longer an anti-tax state. I mean, this is... Well, if you look at bond issues, it, it's California has had that trend for a long time, and most of the bonds on the on the proposition section passed. The only ones that didn't was the water bond. The water yeah. bond didn't pass, which was a little surprising. But then I think there have been three or four water bonds in in the last recent elections that have passed, and maybe people are just tired of that. Well, the housing bond passed the five yeah. billion dollar uh, proposition proposition right. one, but proposition ten. For rent control failed. Well, rent control was interesting. First of all, it wasn't really rent control, and, and what was interesting there is that the, the single backer. Well, it was uh, it was giving right. locals it, the power. It was going to give locals the ability to do it easier. Um, I think the problem there was that the person who was supporting it the most um, it has a, a, a foundation for AIDS uh, uh, in LA, and he's um, has a reputation of being extremely difficult to work with. And I think you need to have a very broad coalition in order to get something like that passed. I think the uh, real estate lobby spent like three times more money. So you really did, if you're going to have a chance, you needed a breadth of a coalition, and it was a one-man band, and you can't do it in a statewide And population. there was a broad coalition against and it. There was, I mean, yeah. against it. It was landlords everywhere. Right. Which are, you know, most landlords are mom and pop businesses, yeah. the vast majority. And it was interesting, the signs they used, it was actually very cozy. It was like almost like 1970s hippie artwork. I mean... Uh, oh, the local ones? But no. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that was a Santa Barbara special. That okay. was only in Santa Barbara. Okay. Against Prop 10? Against Prop 10. Yeah, 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 they look like artwork. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like, what is you know, you think it was like, it was really hippie-like. <laughs> I miss those. <laughs> All right, and then... Uh, Dale, I think you were probably on election night pretty wound up watching the returns come in on Proposition 7. I was most concerned about Prop 7, that's correct. Which this, would give us permanent daylight savings time, except it wouldn't. Uh, well, <laughs> it was one of those confusing propositions. And as I, as I was telling you earlier, Jerry, as we know, the most virulent opponent <laughs> of this proposition was Hannah Beth Jackson. She did, yeah. <laughs> this was not Hannah and Beth. she wrote an eloquent essay about how horrible it would be if we had daylight savings time all the time. And I can understand that point of view. What I, and I think millions of Californians would like, is for the time to stay the same year round. I personally don't care if it's standard time or daylight saving time. Pick one and stick to it. I agree. Right? And, and the timing was perfect because it came <laughs> in the same week we just had exactly. the change of time. Right. So everybody right. was Everyone's grumpy. Like complaining. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was, well, it, passed. Passed. it passed pretty easily. It passed pretty easily. Oh, like, two to, huh? like two to one, right? I want as much daylight as possible. Well, that's what I thought, you know, California sunshine, what's the big but, mystery about you know, it? Hannah you Beth, she mind. really sucked her chin out on that one. She really Why? did. She took a big risk. What was that? Well, she could have alienated a lot of voters. But in fact, I think she's okay with that. <laughs> I think this proposition, unfortunately, is not going to make much of a difference. It's not making it good because it depends on changes to federal law to have any effect. And well, first, the legislature has to do something. And the legislature has to do something by two thirds, so and so federal law has to change. Do you think it was more appropriate that we have the vote on uh, daylight savings time, or the farm animals, or the dialysis <laughs> clinic <laughs> clinics? Jerry, I think this was this ballot was the definitive <laughs> argument against the voter initiative. <laughs> Proposition eight uh, uh, did something that dialysis clinic, the most expensive initiative <laughs> in history. You're kidding? No, 111 million dollars. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and two nobody even knows. Okay, 111 million dollars, and nobody knows what it really does. I'm sure that somebody somewhere knows, but it, not it, will require, now. it would require not more SEIU dialysis workers. All right. That's that's what the point of it was. Okay, so statewide races, no surprise, Governor Newsom. Uh, Steve Poisner, who was running as an independent, a former Republican, apparently is now going to lose after winning most of the night, which yeah. is too bad because it would have been a pathway for people like yourself well, Dale, he was... to, uh, to run for office again. <laughs> <laughs> By abandoning my principles. Um, the, uh, you know, the thing about Poisner is I think he would have been a good yeah, I do commissioner. Too. He was highly qualified. He was the last time. He, he was, was the last time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that and but then um, Marshall Tuck, 
Looks like he'll pull it out. Uh, superintendent of public instruction, mm -hmm. charter school guy, kind of. Yep. Pretty much against a um, some Sacramento hack. Oh, Tony Thurman. Tony Thurman, who people was, really like. Uh, was yeah. running. And but again, this was the most expensive race, statewide race, on the ballot. They spent more money on that race than, than for governor. Sure. And well, why? you also see L.A. School Board, uh, you know, they spend $4 million to, to each, hmm. you know, so there's just a lot of money in, in charters, for sure. And there's a lot of money in, like, guess what, teachers' unions. So I'm not surprised they, they spend so much money. So as a practical matter, does the Santa Barbara School Board pay close attention to what the superintendent of public instruction has to say about anything? Oh, well, certainly. I mean, Ever? There's, there's code. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, but it's, I don't, it's, it's less important than one might think. All right. All right, I want to go back to the national for a minute because um, in the first blush of the, of, of, of the election, there was a lot of jubilance on the part of Democrats mm -hmm. about winning the House. But, but in the last couple of days, it's become clear that the Senate is almost is never going to be able to be won by the Democrats again. I mean, the way that things are being set up and people are sorting each other out in red states, blue states. Do you agree with that? I don't necessarily agree with that because politics is always surprising. However, um, it, was, it was an interesting night for both parties, I think. The Democrats obviously, well, I think obviously, didn't do as well as they had hoped. And the Senate is a real bright spot for Republicans, especially for conservative Republicans. It's a much more conservative body. It's a much more pro-life body than it was before this election. And a much more judge-appointing body. A, a judge-appointing <laughs> body, a appointments in general. I mean, a lot of Trump's appointments, uh, Department of Justice and other places, have been held up. I don't think that's going to happen come January. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Susan Collins of, of Maine and Murkowski of Alaska, the party they, moderates, will have a lot less leverage. They will have a lot less influence. <clears throat> and that's exactly right. I mean, mm -hmm. people like Corker, uh, Flake, McCain right. obviously are gone. So it's, it's a big change in the Senate. Is that, hey, hey, is that the pressure? I'm pretty excited that uh, Democrats took back the House. I think that, sure, we, that was expected, but it's still a huge change. We've had the last two years a very controversial administration with virtually no oversight because Paul Ryan just abdicated any kind of role. So we've had the House Oversight Committee has done nothing. And now we're going to have chairmen uh, that are Democrats. We're going to have chairman of the Intelligence Committee. I mean, it's just going to be... Uh, it's going to be finally what it, the Congress is supposed to be is some of a checks and balance. And what about uh, Justice Ginsburg falling I and hope she's okay. breaking her ribs? I hope she's okay. Three ribs, right. I know. Oh. I hope she's okay. But I mean, I'm curious about that Senate point because so many governor, we flip, Democrats flipped seven governorships, uh, including, you know, Kansas. So I'm curious what that analysis is that the Senate will never be yeah. Democrat again because if a, if a, a woman, a Native American woman... Well, because the states are Kansas not equally statewide. divided. I mean, on every election night, you look at the map and it's sure. like three quarters red and, and, you know, little teeny amounts of blue because they just win more states and, and our votes are totally diluted because somebody in North Dakota, uh, you know, gets to vote for two sure. senators, same as we do. Yeah. And there's just more states that are red. And it's going to continue on that path, I, I believe. I don't know. I don't know. Josh, how many more days until the next election? <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder if we're still going to be talking about Jim Scafidi from the next election. Well, I'm never going to stop <laughs> talking about Jim Scafidi. That's, that's, isn't that the greatest argument against early endorsements? Ever? Oh, my gosh. Oh, we're going back Come there on, Jim. Come on. <laughs> don't be mean. I'm not. Don't be mean. But it, but but it's I agree. There. You know the, this this idea that somehow the party has to come out and endorse people as soon as there's a chance to do it is just is crazy. To Kristen me, Sneddon should be the flag bearer of the Democratic Party, and she's not. I mean, you know she's she isn't? solid. I, what I suspect is the deal here is that Kristen Sneddon and Kate Board both come out of the charter school tradition. So you know, Kristen Sneddon was the. Uh, you know, chairman or you know, the pre president of the board at Peabody, which yeah, is in charge of school. That's true. And I think that the Democratic Party really has a hard time accommodating charter schools. And I think, you know, Kristen um, was going to have a hard time getting the uh, Democratic Party endorsement, even if the timing had worked out. 
Well, I mean, I think that that's a statewide argument that there's a division uh, between you know charter versus non-charter. But I have not experienced it here, and we have. But we're not talking about for-profit. Yeah, we anyway. have. I mean, we have a progressive board as it is now, and we're supportive. We're thrilled with. Was the, it the Doss Williams on the board of Peabody Charter School? I mean, so they, you know, Peabody Charter Peabody Charter School is, a is a charter ago. school, but they they have union employees. It's not an anti-union right. split. Um, so I'd be, you know, if they if that was part of the calculus, I I'd be surprised. I don't. I mean, I think Kate got in after the endorsement. Kate Ford. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more to the timing than it is to her mm -hmm. qualifications right, or her do, affiliation. Do you agree with me, Josh? <laughs> yes, the Dodgers with, will win next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's take that uh, with. With the with the election of of Kate Ford and the re-election of Marsha Croninger, with the support of of Kristen Snedden and in one case Hannah Beth Jackson, that those four, along with Laura Capps, who is at her own uh, uh, tiffs with the Democratic Party, just ask Mayor Hal Conklin about that. <laughs> <laughs> that there is now sort of an informal caucus of independent, very uh, high quality. Uh, elected uh, women officials who will act as a counterweight to the Democratic Party uh, in future elections. I, I, I Do think you agree with him on that? <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat your question? <laughs> All right. Well, it's good to know that Josh is on board with that. And thanks to uh, Josh Molina, Laura Capps, Nick Welsh, and Dale Francisco, thank you all for watching. Please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, to check out my blog posts on politics and media in Santa Barbara and beyond, and also our YouTube channel, where you will find, if you have insomnia, an archive of past shows and interviews. Thanks again to our director, J.P. Montalvo, to our crew, Brad, J. Tara, Adam, Cor Coral, Brad, and Troy. We have a lot of crew. And as always, our senior, top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy executive producer, Hap Freund. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers. <laughs>